Eagle Nation, I am so excited to introduce you to my colleague, my teammate, a mentor, and my friend, Chevy Cook. He's a longtime member of Team RWB who has routinely completed the Memorial Day Murph Hero Workout. And one of my absolute all-time favorite pictures from the Team RWB archives is of him wearing the eagle while deployed using dumbbells that were made of concrete to do a bench press. He serves on the advisory board of another nonprofit organization that I co-founded, The Positivity Project, and he's a fellow nonprofit leader who co-founded and leads the 501c3 Military Mentors, serving as its executive director, and he'll share some more about that today, I'm sure. Since the killing of George Floyd, I've spent a lot of time reading and listening to Black veterans and mentors that I know, and to podcasts. I spent nearly two hours watching a discussion that Chevy had in early June, and in my opinion, it was the most informative and thought-provoking presentation of ideas that I have seen to date on the issues of racism and diversity. Chevy makes a clear and compelling case that these are leadership issues and ones that we are capable of tackling. So Chevy, welcome to the Eagle Nation Zoomcast. Thank you for your time and your energy. And like everybody else watching this, I'm excited to continue learning from you. The steering wheel is yours, brother. Hey, thank you. Thank you for that rousing introduction. Uh, me and Mike go way back. Uh, and I appreciate any time that I can connect with him, but also to connect with my fellow veterans and people that I know who wear the eagle across the nation, across the world. Uh, I'm gonna share a little bit of my thoughts today that come from my experiences. Um, I want to emphasize that these do not represent the DOD or the Army because I'm an active duty service member. These are my own. These are my own uh, thoughts that I put together and have talked over the last month to a couple of different people. Um, if you can see me, uh, we're going to share some slides. If you end up just listening, I try to be as expansive in my thoughts as possible so you get the visuals that I'm trying to represent. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to get us started. And I'm going to click my little timer so I can monitor my time because any, any person who taught at West Point would do that, make sure they be yes, on sir. time. So uh, let's start from this, this, this first one right here, if you can see my slide. Sure can. Um, you'll see a couple different see a couple of different pictures here, all right? I want to do a small introduction of myself, but I think it's important to, to put me in, into the context of this discussion, okay? Mm -hmm. So I came out on a Lieutenant Colonel promotion list last week. I, I got 17 years of service, a dozen of those in the Special Operations community. And I get the, time, the, uh, the great time right now to be a PhD student in Boston, which all of that informs my thought. I alluded to earlier that during my career, I stopped off at West Point and talked for a little bit uh, next to Mike there in the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Leadership, but that is not what totally informs what we're gonna talk about today. If you can see the screen to the top right, you'll see me actually in uniform on a stage and that's in the Pentagon. And I'm next to then acting secretary of the army, it was Robert Speer at the time, and they were giving me this, this award. It's uh, the Diversity and uh, Leadership Award. They give it out once a year to a, a one officer or enlisted who supposedly like, embodies all these values and traits, the, the leadership values that we grew up in in the military, at least in the Army. Um, and I, it was super awkward for me because I was just, I felt like I was just doing my job, mm -hmm. connecting the folks, trying to be a, uh, a leader who recognizes diversity, trying to be a leader who includes folks, trying to be equitable. And then I, you know, got this piece of glass um, that unfortunately is not even on display in my house right now. My mom and uh, my wife pick on me for not putting that piece of glass up. But that's just one piece of it. So if, if you think I'm just talking uh, because I'm a black man or a veteran, no, the army at the highest levels has said, hey, I might know what this is about. Slide one over counterclockwise and you see the emblemology for military mentors. It's the organization that I get to run. We focus on being diverse leaders, focusing on both leadership and leader ability. Uh, we focus on mentorship, of course, for folks in the military across all spheres. So not just the army, but all these other forces as well. And I've got to do that for a couple of years that kind of informs how I think. Right? I, I get to lead volunteers there, which isn't the same as leading military formations. If you slide one more down below that, you'll see another nonprofit listed that's called Promote. I want to uh, just, I, I haven't just been in the MM's lane. Uh, from that perspective, 
Uh, I was a director of learning and development there, and we focused completely on diversity, inclusion, equity. That's the whole premise of Promote, really uh, dealing with, with gender issues and challenges. And I will tell you um, that we worked with the highest echelons of our special operations forces. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those uh, organizations are uh, historic of lore, have done some of the most difficult missions across our nation. And I only say that to say that even they have challenges at times with the stuff that we're talking about, and they brought us in to uh, help them out. But the most important picture I think on here that I'll tell you about my intersectionality with this uh, talk today and the talk across the nation is actually that thing, that funny thing in the corner with a Union Jack and some stripes that look like our flag. Okay, if you're not familiar with this flag, that's the flag of the East India Company. If you know your history, East India Company made some major moves in the world uh, for England uh, back when it was um, leading the world, if you were the world superpower before us. So I can trace the black side of my family back to about the 1880s, 1890s. And we all know why I can't get much further because our people were counted either as three fifths or as property or as not whole human beings. So I can't trace that side of my family back far. But the white side of my family, I actually can. I can trace it back to 1515 and the Abbott family in England. So in particular, one of those descendants is Sir Maurice Abbott. At the time, Sir Maurice Abbott, about the time of the colony starting up, see, Sir Maurice Abbott was the Lord Governor of something called the East India Company. So he came forward to help found the Jamestown Colony, which is our first settlement, and further established the Virginia Colony, which is our first colony. But two subsidiaries of the East India Company formed. One, if you were in the States, was called the Virginia Company. And the other was called the London Company if you were actually in England. These two subsidiaries actually funded all 13 colonies. The reason I bring that story up is because this Saturday is Independence Day. But this Saturday is also important for my family because my, my daughter London was born on the Saturday. As any patriot, as any long standing serving member of the Fort Bragg community would, I named my daughter after. Uh, London and it's tied to this history. I wanted to honor that that part of my family in a unique way um, and I named her London after uh, all of these events that I just laid out. But there's a twist to the story a little bit that you should know. All of our branches of our trees had snake in different directions. The roots go in different directions under the ground. Sometimes they crack the concrete. Sometimes they make you trip and stumble as you walk through the yard. And some of those family members moved down from Virginia to Tennessee and further down into Georgia. And before it was turned over to be a national park, that same family of mine owned Stone Mountain, Georgia. If you don't know your history there, Stone Mountain was a place where Nathan Bedford Forrest and some other folks revitalized the Klan uh, during the Jim Crow era South. And my family, members of my own family up until about the 50s and 60s were members of the Ku Klux Klan. And when my mom in the 70s met my black father on a tango dance floor in Tampa and decided to have me and get married, they split ties with her. That breakdown of, my rela of that relationship led me to be adopted by my next door neighbor. I grew up with a black lady in South Carolina. So as that tree snuck, snaked a bunch of different ways, as the roots cracked concrete. It really affected the whole makeup of my family. So we have this beautiful history that I'm tied to the direct founding of this country. And then we have this sordid history over here as well. So when we have this conversation today, the stuff that I'm sharing with you, I've had these talks in my own family around my dinner table, not because I was just sharing the news, but because I was having to tell history to my own kids about the, the painful history that we have, the unique history we have, the beautiful history that we have in this nation. So as we get around to it today, I might push on you a little bit. It's okay. You may be offended. It's okay. I have lived this my entire life. It runs through my veins. And that is what makes me able to talk about this discussion, all those photos 
um, in a different way instead of just being a person of color and just being a veteran. So let's dive right into it. All right, if you can see this next photo, you can see a, a so whole collage, a, a myriad of images of veterans, of fighters, of innovators, all across these photos. You see people of different services, right? I wanna remind everyone on this call, if you're a veteran, less than 1% of people serve today. We've all heard that statistic, okay? But if you think about what that 1% represents and the types of folks you've come across in your service, right? You've come across, as you can see in the, in the photo, you've come across Medal of Honor recipients. You've come across people um, who fight from the sky, who fight from the sea. You come across other veterans, as you see in the bottom right hand corner, our civilians that work with us, GS types. You've come across military families that even extend our diversity, as you can see in that one photo. And you've seen a bunch of different uniforms. And if you've been in the Army, you've been a part of a bunch of uniform changes in the last decade or so as well. All right. There's also uh, a, a picture there in the middle bottom that is pretty recent. That's Major Kara Corcoran, the most senior female infantry officer we have, who's an active duty trans member serving um, in our army today. So we've seen a lot of difference in our army. And I think one of the reasons we're so powerful across our military, not just our army, is because we can leverage those differences. We can leverage that 1% in a unique way. As you look across these photos, you, you'll see a lot of different things surface wise. You see male, female, tall, short, white, black, Hispanic, uniform, civilian clothes, parachutes, guns, brawn, and brains. You see pilots, shooters, security forces, intel specialists, linguists, cyber, and support personnel. But at a deeper service level, you see individual talent crafted into well-gelled teams consisting of highly trained, culturally aware, warrior diplomats, both in the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the Air Forces, and the Coast Guard, which all of you have served with or are connected to. And I want you to stay connected to what that means. You might even have a Where's Waldo moment and find me in one of those photos as, as well. And that's uh, my time in Afghanistan. That's uh, in front of the Kabul, the embassy outside of Kabul, the largest embassy in the world. So what's the issue? Because we got to define the problem to solve the problem. I, I saw a great podcast uh, or a video from a West Point graduate, Coach K from Duke this morning. I don't know, I think he put it out very recently, but I saw it this morning. And he said to, ch to get after the problem, you have to define the problem. And I appreciate that from a member of the Long Green Line. Here's the issue, point blank. It's George Floyd, but it's just, it's beyond that too, okay? It's Eric Gardner, it's Michael Brown, it's Tamir Rice, it's Sean Bell, it's Freddie Gray, it's Philando Castile, it's Stephon Clark, it's Breonna Taylor, it's Ahmaud Aubrey and many others. That's just in my lifetime, okay? My short life, my short 40 years on this planet. I remember going to the United States Military Academy prep school in 1998, 1999, and hearing about one hour down the street in New York City, Ahmad, Amadou Diallo getting shot 41 times. And that was shocking to me. And it made, the, made me think of the violence against Rodney King when I was in middle school. Um, which I saw those cops get off and I saw LA riots pursue after that. That's the issue. We've torn off the Band-Aid. Let's get into it. With many of these conversations, we talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity. I want to emphasize that I'm not here to teach you about those topics. This is not going to check you off for your sharp brief or your equal opportunity brief for the year. That's not what I'm here for. You need to define what those things are for you and your organization if you're a part of the organizational leadership. But what I will tell you is those three things, diversity, inclusion, equity, they are a three-legged stool. If you don't have one leg, you're not sitting on that stool, okay? If you have equity and inclusion, for example, but not diversity, your organization will flounder. It does not benefit from the creativity and innovation that diversity offers. Okay. If you have equity and diversity, but no inclusion, employees won't do their bus work. So your soldiers won't, your airmen won't, um, or they simply leave 
because they don't feel included. All right, if you have diversity and inclusion, which is mostly what ends up happening when I go do consultation, you know, we don't touch on the equality equity piece just yet. We do have diversity and inclusion, all right? Morale is low as employees simply don't feel like they're being treated fairly and equitably and they will leave too, all right? The key here is recognizing this. You gotta recognize your subconscious tendency to gravitate towards those like you. I taught freshman psychology, PO 100. We could get into heuristics. We could get into um, cognitive biases, but I won't do that. We all have them. If I were to say, raise your hand, if you got biases and you didn't raise your hand, uh, you wouldn't be human, right? We all have them. But we need to recognize that we have a tendency to flow toward those that just look like us. We also need to, if we're astute to those, those tendencies, if we're astute to those blind spots that we have, we need to help others see it too. We need to help others see what they're doing. I would ask that you diversify your friend groups, your work groups, your social media groups, et cetera, to ensure we are properly preparing ourselves and the next generation as leaders, as veterans, as service members, as service connected folks. We all have to do that. That's a part of this leadership challenge going forward. Now I got a bash on this graphic. I have to. A couple of years ago, I was using this, uh, uh, this ver a version of this graphic or this graphic itself. But I'll tell you this, this graphic is a way someone tries to explain equity and equality and reality and it's a bunch of boxes and it's got this, you know, fence there and it's some people seeing a baseball game. Here's the issue with this graphic. The fence is the problem. As clearly as I can put that. The fence rec represents structural inequality systematic oppression. That's what the fence represents over time. Guess what? We won't need the boxes to prop people up at the, at the proper or similar heights if the fence wasn't there. But Chevy, we need the rule of law. We need systems and processes. So that's what the fence represents. Well, this is a wooden fence that people can't th see through. You can easily have a chain link fence and everybody can see through it. But the fence, in a lot of different ways, holds us all back from going together forward. We're all stopped at the fence. So let's get rid of these fences in our organizations. Let's get rid of these fences in our houses if that's where it starts, okay? So I wouldn't be right if I didn't tell you how to do a little bit of influence, right? We're gonna go over the four eyes a day. We went over the issue. We're not gonna go over uh, the influence uh, piece of it, because as a psychological operator and influencer, I think it's important for me to give you some tools to go forward with how to have this leadership conversation. I want to define influence for me as the way you shape, mold, and present information, all right? Influence for me thus does not occur until the message re is received and believed by the recipient, okay? This isn't about persuasion. This is about influence, and they're not synonyms. Persuasion starts with the P. It's a push. It's a used car salesman. That's not what we're doing. Influence starts with I-N, within a person, all right? I think the initial response there to any influence attempt then is something intellectual, which is why you won't see me uh, arguing or getting in a whole lot of fights or slanging a whole lot of emotion, right? Because I'm trying to meet them where they are from a place of connective tissue that we all can agree that we have. And that's a, the highest order brain on the, on the planet of all history. So let's get into those influence, those pieces of influence, okay? What you see here on this, uh, this picture is, I think, something of, of beauty. Uh, and if you can't see the quote because you're gonna be listening, I'll read it out to you, which I usually don't read slides, but I'll do that for you. It is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences, okay? In uh, a book called Bridging Differences for Better Mentoring by uh, Lisa Fain and Lois Zachary, the way they define difference and they remind us of what uh, things like racial difference are. We often see someone, here's a quote, we often see someone and think they're different, but people are not inherently different. Our differences lie between us, not within us. They define difference as intersubjectivity, okay? We all know what intergroup behavior probably is, right? We've heard that terminology before. Intersubjectivity, right? Objective view is a, you know, hey, it's not a part of me. I'm kind of looking at it from a third person perspective. 
subjective, only my, uh, only my views. Intersubjective is the in-between. What we've created, the, the reality we've created between us. So as soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, et cetera, and have fought in a bunch of different places together, we have seen difference. We know what it looks like when it's across the planet. We know what it looks like when it's on in, in our own rank and file, right? The quote here is saying, hey, it's our inability to really recognize who you truly are. And we have done that. We all know if you've ever worked on somebody who's been shot or hurt overseas and has seen the blood come out, we all know we bleed the same, right? Unless you drink more than me, your liver looks like me. Unless you smoke more pipes than I do on occasion, your lungs look like mine too, right? And, but we need to get to a place where we can accept that people are slightly different than us, that they have these, we come from different places. You can have a room full of five white guys. One can be from Alaska, one can be from Australia, one can be from it Italy, one can be from uh, Canada, and one can be from Alabama. I will tell you right now, they got different experiences and we need to recognize that. But we also need to recognize when people may be, all, may be trans, maybe uh, have a different religious point of view, maybe have a different political point of view and still be able to connect because we can do that in the military as veterans and fight oppression. Why can't we do that on a personal level as well? And I want us all to do that. And I want us as a final point here, when you're thinking about influence, when you're thinking about how to connect with people and that intersubjectivity, recognize that race is intersubjective just like money is, okay? A dollar is printed on the same piece of paper that a $20 bill is. They have the same worth except for the intersubjective value we've given it, saying one piece of paper is worth 20 bucks and the one dollar is worth a buck, right? We pull these mineral elements out of the ground to make pennies, to make nickels, to make dimes, right? But they are given value because we agree between us, intersubjectivity, intersubjectively, that they have value, okay? So things like race, we made up, right? I do want us to recognize our differences, skin tones, but things like race, when it comes to structural and oppression, we've created those systems. Thusly, we can take them down. We can influence others to think about them from a different angle, from a leadership angle. As you try to influence, there are three outcomes to every influence attempt, all right? What we all want, obviously, is commitment. We want that that end of the spectrum where we don't have to work hard for it, right? We, we get that enthusiastic agreement. We get the demonstrative initiative and assistance, right? Slide one back from that. And all of us in the military or have, who have served know what compliance is, right? We pull out the knife hand. We say, do this or else, right? Our enlisted counterparts uh, might put a boot in somebody's butt to get them to do what we need them to do, right? We'll take compliance, right? Do what I say because my rank says so. My position says so, but I'll take it. On the back end of that though, the last level is resistance. That's what we think we don't want. I would encourage you to think about your influence attempts, especially in conversations around what is going on now in a different way. Think of resistance in a different way. I believe, I truly do believe that resistance is important in these conversations. Because if somebody is resisting, they thusly have a point of view and a position. And if you know where that position is, you've just entered a chess game as opposed to no game at all. Because you can see their position. You can see where the queen, the rook, and the pawns are as they are discussing this topic, this issue with you. I had a classmate, good friend of mine, have a wonderful conversation with me a week before last. He does not believe white privilege exists. I immediately sent him a message as opposed to getting in the inevitable fight that was on Facebook that was happening. Um, and I sent him a message to say, hey, I wanna understand your perspective. I don't wanna to try to change your mind. I just wanna know how in the world you came to this perspective. Because I grew up in South Carolina where I was called boy by police officers and et cetera, and et cetera, et cetera. And I wanna know how you believe as a Southern conservative Christian living in Charleston, South Carolina, that white privilege doesn't exist. And a veteran, uh, he's a classmate of mine from West Point. I talked to him for an hour and 54 minutes 
and we were laughing and joking and talking about sharing uh, reading resources and videos to really understand the perspective. He had a position. He was resistant to my views. I think we grew a little bit out of that conversation. And as a person that writes down what I'm grateful for every day, if you were to look at my bullet journal, you would see that my conversation with Joe was actually my point of gratitude for that day because I found out where he was and we could move a little bit. We could play chess. Maybe the game actually turned into a little bit of checkers toward the end and it wasn't that complicated, all right? And another piece here is you want resistance because what's not on this chart, for those that can see it, is the word apathy, a, a, a non-positionality. I simply don't care. And that's absolutely what we don't want in any of these conversations. All right, now we're gonna get into some IEDs. All right, that's what the screen says. And uh, I'm sure everyone on this call uh, knows what an IED, an improvised explosive device is. Uh, these are our landmines. These are a couple tough points that I'm gonna talk about that come up in these conversations and have come up for me personally, not just in the last couple of weeks, but for my entire life because I've always been this skin tone, okay? So as we talk about these things, walk with me. As I talk about how to avoid and steer around and work through um, these, these moments, um, be open-minded, okay? We all know that if we've experienced an IED, sometimes you gotta drive through it. Sometimes the track still works, sometimes the wheels still work, you just gotta blow through it. Sometimes people get hurt and injured and we gotta address the situation. Sometimes we gotta jump out of the vehicle and address the issue right at the moment, right? Get our 360 degree security. You figure out how you need to navigate the IEDs yourself. I am going to give you a couple of pointers on how to get through them. All right, here's the first picture. For those that can't see it, it's a, it's a Black Lives Matter um, protest. And um, there's a sign that they're holding that's talking about, um, all, of course, all lives matter, but we're focused on the Black ones right now. So here's your first IED, all lives matter. Listen to me when I say this, all right? A person of common sense, a human of the global citizenry recognizes that all lives matter, okay? But that doesn't exclude Black Lives Matter. It doesn't make it in opposition. I want to make you think about something for a second. If all lives truly matter as a superordinate system, then we wouldn't even have to have Black Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter or Black Trans Matter or any of these other subordinate movements. Really think about that. If all lives truly matter, then we wouldn't have to worry about these others, but we do. So let me come at it to you from the angle of a father. I have two daughters in my house, okay? The other one is Lola, I've introduced you to London. I will tell you this, if I walk out of my office right now and I hear some screaming and both of them come running toward me, but one of them seems like they're okay, and the other one has blood on their face or forehead, who do you think I'm gonna address? My injured kid, okay? As a father, all, all daughters matter, for sure, all right? But in the moment, I'm gonna address the kid that is hurt and injured, right? That's what we have in our nation right now. Maybe you don't have kids. Let's address it from a position of service, okay? If we're overseas, and the enemy has shot one of our troops. Of course, at that moment, all troops matter, for sure. But we're gonna address the troop who's been injured, who's been shot, who might be bleeding out, okay? We need to address the challenge. We need to address the injury before we can move on to the mission, all right? In my household, I need to address my child before I can address uh, the rest of my family, right? I think we can all connect to that idea. And that's how I would invite you to have the conversation with other folks if they're pushing only all lives matter in your, in your face, in your presence. I also want to invite you, uh, because me and Mike are connected to something called the Positivity Project, to another hashtag that I'm really a big fan of. Other people matter, all right? Other people matter starts all external to the self. Everyone external to the self is another. My kids are another. My wife is another. I live in a duplex, the neighbors right through the wall who can hear this conversation. They are others, they matter. My neighborhood, and keep going, you can keep expanding, right? If other people truly matter, if we take, take off 
the selfish tendency to just think about our affinity group, we'd be in a very good place. Other people matter is androgynous. It doesn't have a gender. It doesn't have a race. It doesn't have a color. It doesn't have a height. It doesn't have a weight. Other people are simply other people. So I'd invite you to stretch the conversation to avoid the IED by talking about potentially other people mattering. Here's your other um, IED. Now this is a picture from a simple university brochure trying to show a bunch of people that are di uh, uh, diverse. Uh, you have uh, a whole host of uh, genders, races, ethnicities, backgrounds in the photo for those that can't see it. Here's the other uh, conversation I've had uh, around kind of what I would call uh, a, a, an IED. Well, I grew up in filling the blank part of the world and I grew up around a table where we didn't see color. I didn't see anybody's difference or hey, I just, I didn't know any black people where I grew up. I didn't know any people of color. I didn't know any trans or any LGBTQ folks. I could care less about gender. That's just not how our family grew up. So I don't pay attention to those things. I will tell you, people will say stuff like that around you. I was outside at a barbecue last year in my own courtyard with my own neighbors. And we were having a conversation about this well before any of this stuff blew up in the nation. And someone looked at my, my wife, who's a black woman and said, hey, but I grew up in Texas and we grew up around um, a bunch of different types of people and I just don't see color. And my wife was quick to respond that, well, if you don't see color, you don't see me. And I don't wanna be an invisible person. So I would invite you to help people to not use that language. We do, like the quote I showed earlier, we do need to be able to see each other's differences to leverage them, right? We, we can agree intersubjectivity, intersubjectively that um, we've created things like race and we've created things around race, but we can't forget that we have different skin tones, heritages, backgrounds, ethnicities, genders, et cetera. If you're a soldier out there or a service member from all, all walks of life, okay, Let's break it down very simply what this looks like. If you have a female service member and she's pregnant and she's eight months pregnant, you are not giving her a physical fitness test because guess what? You do see difference. You see the difference. You see the baby bump, okay? And you would be wrong to put them in a position to harm that child. And we can all say, yeah, we can see that, all right? Then in other instances, if, if you, I hope you can see that. I hope that's a, a, a unique or interesting or clear parallel. If you can't see that, I've heard stuff like this. I only see blue if I'm an airman. I only see green if I'm a soldier. Well, let's, let's be frank and open and honest. If you're colorblind, you can't serve. I don't know if people didn't know that. If you grow to be colorblind, you can stay serving, but it's entrance criteria that you can't be colorblind. So if I walk out of my door right now, I can see the foliage. I can see the grass. I can see the sky. I can absolutely tell you what color it is. So if you can see that color, in nature, all humans, global citizenry, are part of human nature, right? You can see my skin tone, all right? So let's, let's, let's get rid of that language and we, let's invite people um, to remember that we aren't colorblind or we couldn't serve or that we can see difference. We absolutely can see difference and we should recognize it. Um, and if you say along those lines, well, the reason I don't see it is because I, you know, I'm not racist. I'm not a racist. I want to be very clear, and I would invite you to read a book called How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi. It's not enough just to be not racist, okay? You need to be actively anti-racist, anti-prejudice, anti-abuse of power, anti-intolerance, anti-inequality, and anti-entitlement. If we were anti, take the leadership stance, if we were actively involved, we could do something about this. If you can see something and say something in a subway, in an airport for a bag, you can see something and say something when a microaggression or any other thing happens to a person next to you. Be a leader. Here's your third IED. What you, can't, what you can see on the screen, if you can't see the screen, it's a bunch of apples with one of them that's bad. So I've heard this piece of the conversation. Oh, Chevy, I'm a cop. I've been a cop for 16 years. Served eight in one state, served eight in another state. I'll tell you some bad people out there and you don't know how hard it is to be a cop. 
all right, blue lives matter. What you also don't know is, hey, my whole force was good. We just had one bad apple in there. That's just one bad apple. That guy on George Floyd's neck is just one bad apple. Don't, don't get against the whole force. All right, some of you out there might have your hackles up, right, over, over a conversation like this, and that's fine. I'm going to invite you to a different way of looking at it. One, you've already heard this before. Bad apple can spoil the barrel. We've all heard that. But hey, man, we don't really, ah, that's just, we talking about apples, right? So let's actually talk about humans. It's just one bad apple. Let me invite you to change the picture. So I just adjusted the picture a little bit, and it shows an orchard. Let me tell you something. This isn't a conversation about the bad apple at all, OK? This is a conversation about the orchard. If you lived in the north, like I do right now, I've been apple picking. And many on this call may have gone to an orchard and done some apple picking, right? Think about it from this perspective. When you stand outside of the orchard, hundreds of trees in rows, can you see the bad apples? You can't. That's the problem. If there's one bad apple on every single tree and there's a hundred trees, that means there's a hundred bad apples in that orchard you're walking into. Think about how scary that is for a person like me when those red and blue lights flash behind me and I'm pulled over. I don't know which part of the orchard I'm in. I don't know when I reach my hand to grab my driver's license, right? When I'm figuratively reaching to pick the apple, I don't know if I'm gonna grab the bat one off of the tree. Think about that. Think about how powerful that is. That's the problem we're talking about. Systematic oppression, right? When this stuff happens over and over in and throughout the system, you can't see it until you're right up on it. And for a person like me, that's too late. That's way too late. And I don't want to live like that. And we all shouldn't. Another piece of this orchard is for many, many years in this country, there's been one type of folk, one set of folk who have controlled the orchard, entrance to the orchard and not, who works in the orchard and not. Also decided what set of, set of seeds were planted and what kind of trees were, were brought up, right? Think about it from that perspective. This is not about the bad apple directly. This is about the orchard. Let's change the orchard. Let's be leaders. All right, here's the last one. And it's a photo that could have was, was taken very uh, recently, um, but this photo could have been taken in the 50s. It could have been taken in the 90s in the riots as well. There was a gentleman holding the upside down American flag, which I, um, pains me to see outside of a wine and spirit uh, store that's uh, burning down. Here's your last ID or conversation you might get drawn into. Hey, I understand BLM. I understand Black Lives Matter. I understand protest and pain. But I can't get with the looting and the destruction of our, of our nation. I can't get with people who can't respect the rule of law. This is a tough one, all right? There's been arguments about, hey, why are they destroying their own community? I'd invite you to read something called A White Rage by Dr. Carol Anderson. I'd invite you to re uh, read something called The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. I invite you to read something called Stamp from Birth by also Ibram Kendi as well. And I'll invite you to watch 13th on Netflix if you're not a reader, or I Am Not Your Negro, that's a story about James Ball, and that's also on Netflix. Or Just Mercy, that's about Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative. He has a book version as well, uh, and he's still living down there in Montgomery, Alabama, a social justice uh, leader out there. I invite you to look all of that for the context. This is about a social contract being broken, okay? You say, how can, you know, we gotta be, you know, if we can't control, if we can't adhere to the rule of law, then I can't understand, I can't get with you in your protest. Let me be clear. The rule of law was, uh, is not being adhered to because the social contract is broken. We, the people, 
is a social contract. It's intersubjective. The Declaration of Independence and the laws and the protect and serve out there, those are all intersubjective social justice issues. They're social contract pieces. These people are burning down pieces of the establishment that doesn't support them. And let me be clear, because of redlining and a whole lot of other things you can read about, these are not black owned businesses, okay? These are not people of color tearing up their own neighborhood that they own, all right? The majority of these businesses and places are owned by other people. Does it make it right? No, it doesn't. And the argument might, might, might come, well, I've seen black business owners outside you know, with their Second Amendment rights holding a rifle, protecting their own establishment. That's true, right? But if we, if we look at the bell curve of how many people own businesses, how many CEOs own the Targets and the Walmarts and everything else that's out there being affected by this, on the tail ends of the bell curve would be your people of color. Okay. So that's, they're, they're not tearing down and, and rioting against their, and tearing and burning down their own, the stuff that they own. They're rebelling against a, a longer, broader, deeper establishment. And I want to really invite you to this piece of the conversation. Please read the entirety of a letter from a Birmingham jail from Martin Luther King that I think explains it. Now, little select quotes have been pulled out, but I invite you to read the whole 400 lines. And I will tell you, he wasn't writing this to fellow per persons of color in the civil rights movement. He was writing this to Southern Christian preachers on the other side of the tracks. And he was trying to invite them to understand why the person of color, in his words, he used Negro, was pushing back on the nation. So let me share some of those quotes just so you can get the context. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. If one recognizes the vital urge that has engulfed the Negro community, one should readily understand public demonstrations, why they're taking place. The Negro has many pent up resistment, resentments and latent frustrations and he must release them. So let him march and try and understand why he must do so. If his repressed emotions are not released in nonviolent ways, they will seek expression through violence. This is not a threat, but a fact of history. And if you do your history search, not just in America, when people are repressed, if people don't have that social contract, they push back. Our whole nation was founded on people pushing back against the establishment in Europe. And you see it appearing here today. All right, I've beat you up enough. Let me give you some ideas going forward as to how to uh, be a leader in situations like this. When I gave out a message when I sent out a message uh, from MM, when this initially happened, uh, George Floyd started uh, this, this movement. I started with this quote from Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. I gave you a bunch of stuff and I will give you a couple more. I hope you would do better now that you know better. The first thing I'm invite everyone to do, if you can't see the screen, is a person looking into a mirror and what they see in the mirror is, is uh, pretty graphic. Right. Lead yourself first. That's, a, that's the title of a book by my friend, Mike Irwin, uh, and, a, and, a, and a title that I believe in. You can't lead others if you can't lead yourself first. Mike, Margaret Rioch, who was an organizational psychologist, organizational behaviorist back in the 70s, she's quickly stated, if you are not followed, you're thusly not a leader. And then an extension of that conversation was, if you couldn't lead yourself first, you can't have followers. It's very clear, okay? I invite everyone here to do a clear-eyed self-assessment. Do a self-audit. See where you are. Where are you having uh, issues? Where are your implicit biases becoming explicit? When you walk down the street and you see a pride flag or a Black Lives Matter um, emblem in somebody's yard, do you have a visceral reaction? Why? Lead yourself first. Figure out why you're having that response. Do you, when is the last person, last time you had a person of color over to your dinner table? Is it because they live far away from you? We all have cars. We can drive. We all have invites. We have Skype and even this Zoom 
uh, media where we could talk to people that are of difference. So do a clear out self-assessment. Where are you, leader? All right, the second one here is the set of blocks that are falling and it's a hand interjecting, stopping the blocks from falling. This is your second thing that I want you to do. Be an upstander, stop being a bystander if you are. Leaders intervene, okay? That's what that hand represents. I said in my original message from MM that complacency stokes the coals of prejudice. People who stand by in moments like these are complicit with the blatant injustice. And I stand by those words, they are my own. They weren't written for me. I really do believe that. The reason these issues still exist is because too many people have said this isn't affecting me or my community. Stand up, be a upstander, okay? If you can't see the picture, it's a white hand. And I chose that picture specifically because in the majority of these instances, we need the majority to stand up. If you don't wanna go and get on the front lines, get together in your front office and make this stuff happen, right? Put your own skin in the game, no pun intended. Where are you investing your money, leader? Where are you intervening, leader? Where are you injecting your time, leader? It's on us, it's on you, it's on me, it's on we to make this better. Veterans specifically have served in the dirt and the danger across the world with people from all walks of life. If we can fight oppression elsewhere, you got dang right we can fight it here, okay? Let me be very clear about that. As a member of Team RWB myself, if we can fight this stuff overseas, I am going to be involved in my community as a leader here for our people, all of us, regardless of what they look like. And I invite you to do the same. Here's my last slide, right on time. <laughs> um, this one is a picture of my kids. For those that can't uh, see them, uh, they are the most beautiful kids on the planet. I'm biased. There is my biases coming out, right? My two daughters are on the screen. They're on, a, on the screen uh, for a reason. I think we really need to invest in the next nation. We've seen it, um, a former President Barack Obama talk about how we need to focus on the next generation the last couple of weeks, for example. And sometimes I get uh, I would tell you overseas in Arabic, uh, president is uh, Raisi. And I got called Raisi Obama whenever I was in the uh, embassy with a suit and tie on. I have some of those tendencies. We got the same ears and all that stuff too. Um, so that's why I use them as an example. But you know, uh, these kids today, I think this next generation, whether it's millennials or, or Z or the iPad nation, whatever you want to call them, are the ones that are going to make the difference. Let me be clear about this and my point here. I really do believe that if you're older than me, you did a lot of good work. You pushed the civil rights uh, movement forward. We did a lot of great stuff in the nation. We made a lot of progress. But all of those people, they had to make such a mental shift, right? They had to go from seeing lynchings and uh, separate water fountains and entrances uh, to being accepting of all of those around them. And many people have done that. That's why our nation is great, right? But they had to do a giant mental shift. If you're about my age, we had an other growing up and it was the LGBTQ community, right? If you were too effeminate, the words like, hey, don't be a faggot, don't be gay came out. And that ain't, is not right, right? We had to get all of that out of our language to be a leader today, to have them serve openly in our military as veterans, right? We had to do a mental shift. I don't think it was as big as the older generations, right? We had to still do a shift though. Guess who hasn't had to make a shift? My kids, our kids, the next generation. Their other are bullies. They fight on people, they fight people who pick on others, right? That's a beautiful thing. And that's where we can invest. We can put character into this next generation. They already have the inclusive uh, language. They already see the advocacy, the justice, the activism, they already see it. We had the Cosby show, they have stuff like Blackish, right? They can see all kinds of representation in media, in the news, on TV, on the screen, in their ears. They can hear it, they can see it, they can feel it, it's all around them. There's a, an autistic puppet on Sesame Street, for example. That's, representat that's crazy, that's representation that we didn't have. They don't have to do the mental shift. We can keep the language out of their mouth. 
We can keep the hate out of their mouths by not teaching it to them, by not letting our biases infect our own homes. This isn't about Dr. Seuss kindness, okay? This isn't about that. This isn't about being fake and making up entities. This is about being real and realistic with what exists right outside of our homes. And it starts with you, leader. All right, I'm gonna pause here for any questions that Mike may have, uh, but I wanna close with a quote. In Foreign Affairs, recently I read something by Gideon Rose, and it said that professionals warn and plan while amateurs scoff and ignore them, okay? Don't be an amateur at this moment. By the time a crisis arrives, he, he extends the quote, by the time the crisis arrives, it's too late. And you can do nothing more than just react and suffer. I don't wanna react, I don't wanna suffer. I wanna be a leader. Let's be leaders together. And just for those who are watching, to make sure you know, this is just for, <laughs> this is for Mike, to make sure you know. I had on my MM shirt the whole time, I'm gonna put the eagle right here. I had this on the whole time too. Let you guys know where I stand. All right, Mike, yeah. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Outstanding, Chevy. And that eagle looks like good on you, looking, looking, still looking awful fit for, uh, for someone who's in, who's in grad school and not doing the, uh, the mandatory PT every day. That's impressive. Oh, that's, that's right. I got a wife for a personal yeah. trainer, man. She yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, first of all, thank you. So um, articulate so uh, concise, under one hour. I mean, I know you condensed basically an hour and 54 minutes down. And from my observation, you got pretty much everything, right? Uh, so if there's a way to kind of trim, you know, the proverbial fat off of like an hour 54, you did it in, in under one hour. Um, that's remarkable. And uh, just speaks volumes to how, how passionate you are and how driven you are to make a difference on these issues. Um, so many powerful nuggets and examples and analogies that you were able to give in there that I think really resonate with people and as they hear it, uh, and even as you said, even people who don't necessarily see things like uh, exactly the way that you do right now, um, like it's, it's a process, you know, I think to, to start changing, you know, the way we think, you know, about a lot of things. And uh, to me, that's what's so powerful is just how clearly you strung together personal examples with examples from history to the analogies and ideas that you're able to weave together from books that you've read and conversations you've had with people. And, uh, you know, honestly, you know, I've only got really one question just for this, you know, for the sake of time. Uh, I know, you know, you've got other things going on in your life and, you know, try to keep these to about an hour. Um, you know, I, I, you know, tee this up with you a little bit in terms of, you know, in advance of the conversation. It's just this idea, and you did a great job already kind of touching on it throughout the process, but this idea of, like uh, embracing, this is something that the Dalai Lama often tweets out about. I follow the Dalai Lama. I think he's pretty fascinating on Twitter. And he talks about this idea of shared humanity. And one of the best ways that we can, you know, sort of overcome our differences is to never forget that other people bleed red. They need oxygen, right? Every one of us is going to die, um, right? We have a lot of the same fears, whether it be of heights or, right? And, and so there's that constant tension and balance between, um, like appreciating in, and including the diversity and the differences that we have, but, but also not forgetting that there's this other component. And you already touched on this a, a little bit in terms of your experience, you know, downrange and all that, but didn't know if you had any final sort of thoughts to kind of put a bow on it with this, this question about how do you strike that balance? Because I think it's something that the military does so well, and it's why the military and the veteran community is poised to lead on these issues. Um, as it has done so uh, in the past. But yeah, we'd just love to hear your thoughts in closing on, on that idea. Yeah, um, I, I'll answer in a couple of different ways. Um, there, I, when I was a young uh, budding guy in psychology, I, I was like, well, yeah, I want to do this little experiment. Gave a bunch of different type of demographic people, a bunch of them red hats, a bunch of them blue hats. You know, put them on, didn't give them any instruction, put them in a room. What do you think happened? Regardless of what gender, size, skin tone, you know, the red hats started to go toward each other and the blue hats started to go toward each other because they were like asking, like, why do you have a red hat? Why do those guys have blue hats? You know, did, was there a process? Did you say something? Let's try, they were trying to figure out what they had in common yep. to earn this red hat or this blue hat. And I find that interesting, right? I find it interesting that 
when we don't know much about each other, but we see one little thing that's maybe a little bit similar or we have in common, then we want to kind of deep dive into that and find out about each other, right? We, like we've all, a bunch of us have been through stuff like Ranger School or some selection process or aerosol or, or some other type of training or contracting or something. And when we first show up, it's like, hey, you know what sports? Oh, yeah, I see you got on a, a Chicago Bears like hat or, yeah. you know, hey, I see the mug that you have. You got a Team RWB mug. I know what that is, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and then you start talking about kind of these these connections that we have while also recognizing our differences. Right. It also comes from, hey, man, I'm from, you know, North Cal versus South Cal. Uh, South Cal. It is, there's some differences in the experiences mm -hmm. in California. You start teasing that stuff out. And I think it's important for us to remember, yes, like you said, there are differences between us, but there's so much commonality, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much commonality. And anybody who's deployed has tried to do this, right? You go to some far off nation, some far off place as a leader, and you try to connect with the local community. And what do you start talking about? The fact that you got a son and they got a son and kids and, you know, and these kind of different, uh, is, you know, experiences. Hey, you, you like, you, we're, your kids are out there kicking a soccer ball. You mind if I kick around a soccer ball, right? We all like sweets. So we start pulling out <laughs> treats and stuff to share with each other because those shared experiences connect us to the global citizenry. I think in times like this, we tend to forget how close we actually are. Mm -hmm. I think we look so hard at, you know, our lived experiences of being so different and don't see all these other lived experiences that are so alike. I alluded to the fact that I talked to my classmate for like an hour and 50 something minutes because he doesn't uh, believe in white privilege. And we start talking about kind of differences between using the terminology white privilege and white advantage, which is another discussion I'd invite people to, to look into. It's real, there's scholarly research about it, mm -hmm. about using those kind of different terminology and how people interpret it at a subconscious level. And as we started talking about our experiences, mind you, we, we served in the same community. We went to the same school. We had all these, you know, he, he's in South Carolina um, and I grew up in South Carolina. We, we start talking about all these places where we actually, mm -hmm. uh, maybe our politics are very, can be very different, um, but all these instances where we could connect, that, looking for that connective tissue right. to find out how to understand our differences was very important. And I think that's what really what re leaders do. If we go back to our most basic formations, if we served, or our most basic elements and organizations, we had to create a culture, a culture of inclusivity. And if that inclusivity just meant like the bandits or whatever little kind of emblem we had, right? It was around pushing that forward and um, coming together. And we would find commonality in some of the, the wildest things. And the military has been good has been at the forefront in many instances of pushing us to do that. Again, I can't emphasize enough that these are, these are leadership challenges. Every ism is a personal leadership problem where you are letting your stuff creep out in ways that you shouldn't, or it's an organizational leadership problem where you stood by and you let someone step on somebody's toes, yeah. sexually harass someone, or, or even worse. Um, yeah. Those cops that let that cop stand on George Floyd's neck, that was a leadership challenge. That was a leadership problem. They could have pushed him off and they didn't because guess what? Most people don't know. He was the trainer of those other three. Mm -hmm. So he was serving as a leadership example of what supposedly right looks like. And I don't want to get into the political divisions of what that may be and what they may, may mean when they have their day in court. But I will also remind you when that leadership challenge happened, there's a person there on the ground, on the ground for over eight minutes who didn't get their day in court and caused a human death. And that's unfortunate. Yeah. Be a leader. Yeah, no, and I just put a, you know, kind of tie everything together, like through that lens, I think that that is to me, and that's what I find the most um, challenging, but also inspirational about the way that you framed it. I haven't heard anyone else out there, you know, really kind of communicate um, through the lens of leadership and as you know like a fellow study student of leadership like you someone who's taught it someone who thinks about it um, you know to me like that is I think a core idea look and you know every just about every organization I know out there you know has room to improve um, I certainly okay. know the team red white and blue does we've talked about it internally as a staff and we formed a committee of diverse voices trying to pull in and, and figure out hey what can we do 
to ensure that uh, that every veteran and every member of the the organization, of course, we're 30% non-veteran, but that every veteran certainly feels at home and feels that when they see that eagle, that that they see that same sort of patriotic spirit and pride looking back at them as they felt when they were in the military and and hopefully where they were accepted and embraced in the military, um, despite their differences from people, you know, in their squad, in their section, in their troop. And to me, that's like a big part of it is that, you know, We've got room to get better. We're committed to that. It's a process to get there. Um, and conversations like this help us, um, you know, and, and educating ourselves, but also just being committed to, you know, in the long run, as you talked about in that last slide, right, this is about, you know, how we build a better future, right, and, and how we build better leaders over time to be able to deal uh, with the challenges that we face, because I'm not sure if you're looking around, but there's just a few leadership challenges right now uh, facing the world and facing our country. And um, we are in, in no way, shape or form uh, in an excess of strong leaders right now. And so we need future generations to see that leadership potential and greatness in themselves. And again, listening to uh, presentations like you shared with us today, you know, is, is a part of that journey, that process to growing, to be ready to lead in the 2020s and beyond. I agree, man. It's our turn, right? So, it's our turn to step up, regardless of where we are, what, what stance in life uh, we have, what positionality we have. I get a lot of questions around, hey, Chevy, what can I do? What can't you do, right? There's a lot of opportunity out there. If you don't have the money, right. you have the time. If you don't have the capability, um, you have the intellectual, you might have some intellectual space that you can give somebody. Maybe you can't talk. Maybe you're not as quote unquote eloquent as I am. You can mm-hmm. listen, right? Yeah. And you can connect and you can hug and you can be physical. Yeah. Um, you can work out with folks. Uh, every week here on Hanscom, uh, ever since we closed down for COVID, we've been running the flag around. 30 minute increment, signing people up. Not advertising it, not putting it on social media, just running the flag. Mm-hmm. People are like, hey, what are those guys about? What are you doing? Because we can all coalesce around the flag regardless of where we're from, yeah. right? So you can do little things in your community just to make an impact and touch and connect people of difference through these little pieces of connection. It's our turn, yeah. leader. Awesome. Chevy, thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, your experience. Thanks, and uh, again, all of you nation and everyone who watches and listens to this is better for it. So thank you so much. And I uh, look forward to seeing you and giving you a high five and a hug in person, hopefully sometime uh, yeah. later this year. But uh, thank you so much.